Jesus. I think we're in the lobby now, Rip. Okay. But it's just that still, I think, so it's fine. Okay, now you're now you're in the webinar. Okay. Okay. So you can announce yourself, Raya. Go ahead. Okay. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're viewing from. Welcome to the one-on-one -on -one dialogue, success stories winning in the Indo-Pacific market. Here we'll exclusively be discussing Malaysia and the dialogues will be led by uh, Mr. Vijay Punusami, who's the Director of International and Public Affairs of the QI Group and Executive Board Member and Chairman of the Aviation Group of World Tourism Network. And he is also a PBEC corporate member. And we also have Mr. Adlin Usman, who's the Managing Director of Endeavor Malaysia. Thank you for your time today. And I will leave the floor to you both now. Thank, Thank you very much, Raya. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and, and Adeline, we, we actually started backstage a little discussion before uh, Rhea put us uh, live in the webinar. But I, I, was, I was telling you, it, it's actually most timely that we're having this discussion on Malaysia, as all the, the eyes of the world are uh, very much focused on a decision which is very imminent as to who will actually be leading the Malaysian government in the hours to come, if not the minutes to come. Uh, and, and I think it's very timely and I, I, I great to have you, Adeline. Adeline uh, is, is the Managing Director of the Endeavour Group in Malaysia and very well versed in, in uh, social political uh, life in Malaysia. And I think it's, it's most appropriate that we could have that very off the cuff kind of discussion uh, on on Malaysia first, and and hopefully uh, learn uh, a few things which we can then share with our uh, colleagues in the region uh, and also with with PBEC. Uh, so, Adeline, without further ado, let me invite you to share some of your perspectives into where Malaysia is at today as we speak today. Uh, I know a decision is imminent as to where Malaysia goes from here. But let's see where we are today and what are your hopes and expectations moving forward? I, I think, I mean, obviously we have to be apolitical in a sense, right? but everybody is somehow or other leaning towards a better change for their country, right? And I think Malaysia, if you speak to any Malaysian on the ground um, who's above the age of maybe 25, would say memories of the, the time that Malaysia was heralded as an Asian tiger, right? 97, 98. And we've been struggling to, to regain that status somewhat, right? Of being one of the few ASEAN countries that are punching above their weights. Now, I, I guess what we're hoping for, I think if you look at it um, in terms of where we are in the political landscape today, um, what isn't being said publicly is the fact that it is the TikTok generation that took over the, uh, uh, the elections in GE15. Because the unexpected wave of Prikata National taking over 72 or 73 seats uh, was shocking to everybody simply because nobody nobody expected them to come from behind and and literally take the number two spot, and it's because of the way that they campaigned. So they targeted uh, knowing that there was a huge block of new voters coming in, close to six million voters between the ages of eighteen to twenty one. Um, they decided to go through a completely different digital strategy, and then it goes to show, right? Um, at the end of the day, um, at the end of the day, if you're voting for someone, it's about sentimentality. It's about what you see on and 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 what you hear and what you hear your friends are saying. And there's a lot of people who voted at that age group, voted based on what their friends voted. And that's a tricky part, Vijay. It becomes a mob mentality. You're voting because you don't know who to vote. So I trust my friends. It's almost as though you are doing trust transference. And that's where I guess it's important to see uh, quite a lot of, uh, not just Malaysia, right? So it happened in the US with Trump, right? It probably happened in, in the UK as well, right? Um, and it's something that I guess we are, you know, exceedingly um, not well, I guess, armed for, right? Knowing that the digital um, campaign strategy has to be not just secondary now, it has to be primary. Yeah. So you're saying basically the, the political world has become predictably unpredictable. <laughs> I, I guess so, but everything's now now boiled down to sixty second sound bites, right? Because the the attention span for the younger generation, the Gen Zs, are extremely short. I mean, uh, far be it from the days of us watching television and you're sitting through a a layer of one and a half to two minute uh, advertisements, right? 
I don't think any of our kids these days would want to wait for an ad. They'll wait for the skip button. That five seconds is enough for them to say, you know, ADD, I've got to skip this. And that's what we're, that, that's essentially what we're seeing in the new generation of voters, right? Whatever that sort of appeals to them on a very intimate la layer or level from what they can view, they'll probably vote based on sentiment. Understood. But if you take it now for a, another generation whose attention span, uh, I suspect, is a bit uh, longer, the business community. If you look at the business community, how do they relate to what's happening right now in Malaysia? I, I think the business community is holding their breath because I think, um, I mean, Asian countries in general, government looms large, right? Uh, whether it's giving subsidies, whether it's giving tax breaks, whether it's giving incentives to entrepreneurs, um, everybody is sort of baiting their breath. And I think the forward-thinking business owners obviously would want a new face to government. I think we discussed this in the backstage, Vijay. I mean, giving it to Muhyiddin, while fine and well, he's done it before. He's PM8, right? Anwar has never been prime minister. I, I think let's give the chap a chance and see whether he can, he can bring Malaysia, at the very least, in a different direction. Good or bad, give the man a chance to, to prove to the voting public, to the Malaysian rakyat, that he can bring Malaysia in a different direction. So I think the business uh, community is, is just, I guess, patiently waiting to see a different change moving forward for the next five years. Because the, 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 your reading is that the government, whichever government that would be, does have a, an important bearing on economic life in Malaysia? Uh, definitely. I think... I think um, so, again, to quick, quickly sort of bring in terms of how Endeavor functions, so Endeavor supports entrepreneurs um, because the idea was to do what the Silicon Valley effect uh, does for the entrepreneurs there. You succeed, and then in the success, you then pay, pay it forward for the next generation of entrepreneurs. So Malaysia, much like Singapore, we the government is very good at building support tiers for in the case of entrepreneurs uh very well like there's a there's the there's a there's a government body called MDEC that is built specifically to help entrepreneurs so government is is it looms large right and i think the intention is real that the government is there to help the people it's just the fact that i guess what was missing in the past five to maybe five years is stability vj we have the infrastructure we have the big government machineries it's just stability is the one that everybody's i guess waiting or be bated breath to see whether we're going to get that for five years and that stability would have a direct bearing on not just the economic life of Malaysia, but also the social social life in terms yeah, of communities yeah. moving forward. Definitely. I mean, if you look at it, um, in the previous government, I'm not sure which one, because we changed three prime ministers in the past GE. Yes. One of them, one of them uh, finally changed the, the minimum wage. So that completely changed the way. I, I don't think the minimum wage is high enough. I honestly think that it could be higher. Um, but that that was a massive sea change, right? So you can no longer lowball uh, 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 individuals in Malaysia, regardless of whether you're a local or a foreigner, right? I think that's what needs to happen. Malaysia, for it to become a high-income nation, needs to begin from the bottom up, right? We need to be able to provide fair economic opportunities for everybody. Yeah. I, I mean, it goes back to the point, which actually is probably uh, exercising many people's minds around the world in terms of ESG. Uh, because, I mean... Uh, Increasingly, uh, the business community is becoming alive to the fact that they need to engage more in communities because you cannot operate in isolation or in a vacuum. You are part and parcel of a community. And the more you engage with the community, the more you have a chance to actually do better. Yep. Uh, is this something you're seeing also in Malaysia, that, that uh, businesses are becoming more and more uh, alive to the need to engage more with communities, be part of communities, and seek the endorsement, if not respect and support of communities? Definitely. I think, um, so ESG, I think a lot of people are now realizing you know, greenwashing doesn't really work, right? You've got to do something that is relevant for not just, I guess, not just for the ones with a sustainable tag on their business, but, but normal businesses that have traditionally been, um, I wouldn't say dirty, but not exactly green, right? Um, and I guess working with communities is important simply because, I mean, if you know Malaysia very well, it isn't a big secret that Malaysia generally functions on a few major cities, right? You've got your KLs, your Johors and your Penangs and Sabah Sarawak, right? And I think I think because of the fact that um, we we focus on the main cities and businesses tend to expand in that, in that general diaspora in that region, um, the engagement to communities is again very uh, disjointed. So you focus on these, these core tier one cities, right? So I think moving forward, um, again, just to, just to bring back to how we started, right? With the TikTok generation, it doesn't matter where you're from, right? You, you can build communities online. You can, you can send and you can relate 
via your message to people who might find you know, some semblance of attachment towards your brand or your business, and they don't have to be in the city centers anymore, right? Uh, and I guess that's what I think we're seeing with all these new age businesses, um, where we're getting a lot of um, a lot of support from from traditionally areas that you never would target your marketing dollars at before, right? And and, and this is new because I guess because of the fact that people are now being um, removed from, I guess the pandemic is also a good thing, right? Being removed from the traditional city centers to gain a, a, a stable job, right? You can work from anywhere now, potentially. And potentially that leads to a kind of democratization of the workforce. Yes. And, and we see that now. I think, I think the democratization of the workforce is interesting simply because, and I had this conversation with a colleague earlier today, is the fact that we are seeing people who are straight out of college without degrees earning US dollars because they are talented in different ways, like doing you know, artwork for Canva or any of these online gig demand you know, work that pays you in, in different currencies. And I think that's something that our generation, Vijay, we would, I mean, even, even, even you're talking about not even 15 years ago, un un unthinkable, right? You could essentially earn more money doing side gigs than you would your main job. Hmm. I think you, you mentioned greenwashing, and, and that makes me think of a, a, of a subject matter which is close to my heart. It, it, it opens up the discussion on integrity. Because at the end of the day, companies which engage in greenwashing are more focused on painting an image rather than actually uh, doing the right things. They want to be seen to be doing the right things, uh, even though they may not be interested at all in doing the right things, which is very washing, which extends to many other areas beyond the environment. So which basically begs the question about the, the requirement of integrity, integrity, not just in the uh, business world, but also in the uh, public sector, in the government sector, is this an area you think uh, through the elections moving forward, uh, something Malaysia will pay more uh, attention to? Oh, definitely. I think now we're going to COP27 this year, right? COP26 was, 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 was earth shattering because we are very much still dependent on coal, right? Most of the Asian countries yeah. are still dependent on coal. And last year, I remember I was helping uh, a very, ex very, um, very important uh, coal uh, power plant. I think it was pretty large. I think it was three or four megawatts. Um, it was a JV between a Malaysian conglomerate and an Indonesian conglomerate. And they were having issues getting funding because they're coal-based. And China can't fund coal-based plants anymore. So they couldn't get financing. And, and most of the global banks, your Goldman Sachs, your JP Morgan's won't finance because they signed the COP26 agreement, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, there's no such thing as greenwash. You can greenwash now. No one's going to be able to greenwash in the next five years. You can't be offsetting... Your, your carbon footprint by buying green credits over the next five years because you're not going to get anyone to finance your business. And that's the truth, right? Sooner or later, you've got to show that you've got a real sustainable plan on making your business sustainable, right? Excellent. Let me wonder if you take what's going to happen uh, in the next few minutes or hours, uh, what do you see in terms of impact for Malaysia itself? Uh, so give me the two scenarios, the two likely, likeliest of scenarios. Uh, hopefully, there are no more than two likely scenarios <laughs> uh, going forward. So as far as we know, as to right now at 5.14 p.m. Malaysian time, the two leading uh, uh, leaders of Parikata National and Pakatan Harapan are meeting with the king to present their numbers. And I think from what we understand with the limited information we have is the fact that Anwar, which is potentially PM10, has the numbers to prove that he's going to be prime minister. Now, you see, the, the funny thing, Vijay, is the fact that talking about economy again or finance is the fact that Malaysia, uh, under the previous administration, passed the budget literally a month ago which let's be honest here, the government of the day that's going to come out tomorrow was neither one of the governments that passed that budget. Okay? So either that was a fairy tale budget, which may be very much so if they don't take it up again, or it's a budget that through gritted teeth they have to carry because it has some populist moves in there, right? So, so I guess from, from the, from, from, not from the business perspective, but from the average Malaysian, the question is, how is the next government going to help me feed my family better? Right? Are the petrol prices going to keep going up? Are my uh, subsidies going to continue? 
uh, is my taxes going to be, you know, uh, uh, because I think they also increased the, the bracket. So you no longer start paying taxes at a certain range. It's gone higher. So for the lower income group, they don't pay taxes. So these are the things that would really impact the ordinary Malaysian lives, right? Which I guess is what everybody's sort of hoping for. And I think in some ways from, from me, and this is just from myself, not even Endeavor, right? it's just me as an, a Malaysian yeah, citizen, is that I do hope for someone that hasn't done it before, as I mentioned earlier, let's give Pakatan a chance to, to give them five years of uninterrupted uh, um, administration, right? And allow Malaysia to write itself uh, back on track. What, what would you say should be, let's say the new government's priorities uh, as from the moment they are, basically uh, given the task to lead the uh, Malaysian government, what should be the, the let's say, top three? Okay. So, so if you if you remember the GE14, the top three was 1MDB, 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 right? So that's done now. We're done. Let's move on, right? Um, so number one is Ringgit needs to recover. Right? That, that we, are, we are sliding. I've never seen, we've never seen the Ringgit slide this much before. I mean, notwithstanding the US dollar is obviously sort of, you know, appreciating as well. Yeah. Uh, second, we're looking at the worst recession that's going to come, uh, or if not, it's already here, number two, right? So we've got to manage that really well, right? Because that's going to impact everybody. And finally, I think for once, um, I guess address the inflationary pressures for real. The last uh, administration claimed that inflation is 8%. That's, that's a lie, Vijay. I mean, I'm, we're seeing literally food prices going up 30%. And that's that's something that is your salary is not going up thirty percent. So these three things, right? They're economic in nature, right? Yeah. Uh, and I guess why these three things are important is because this this is a blanket issue that everybody gets affected, no matter whether you're rich or poor, right? Um, obviously, maybe the rich isn't so so adversely impacted, but the the US dollar to ringgit Im impacts everyone because you're talking about trade arbitraging. Unless of course you're selling in US dollars, then that's fine, but everybody else suffers, right? But. The question which, which I put to you now, the three priorities you focused on are, are all, in a way, economically driven. They're there, but they have an impact on yeah. people's day-to-day -day lives. And they also have an impact on, on businesses. Uh, so I suspect the new government, uh, let's say new uh, minister, economy, uh, minister of finance, will be the key person in the next government uh, because trying to navigate through these uh, very turbulent waters uh, domestically, but also internationally uh, is, a, is a tall order. Uh, but yet uh, I can see people are actually trying to be in the government uh, despite this obviously very challenging uh, times because but, of, there's a feeling people need to help and they can help, they, they can offer some way forward in these very difficult times? I, I think when economies turn down, that's our tagline, entrepreneurs turn up. And I think good ministers, especially the ones that come from a business background and the ones leading Ministry of Finance should obviously come with some manner of business background, should be the ones that are put at the forefront to turn this around. I think these are the ones with the good intentions, notwithstanding the fact, Vijay, that we have a massive civil service, one of the largest in the world. So despite governments changing, the civil service remains constant. So these are the these are the people who are literally shouldering the weight of Malaysia's uh, economic engine, right, or growth. That being said, leadership is obviously important, and the buck stops with the with the ministers or the leadership. Um, so if you're looking at it from the perspective, how do we how do we? I mean, I think the, the the real question is how do we improve Malaysia properly in 100 days? And I think 100 days that's what everybody does, right? I think I think from the perspective of if you can if you can show clear indications that the economy is moving, KLCI recovers, the stock market recovers slightly. Um, there is bullish interest from foreign investors coming back into Malaysia. Um, you know, and 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 I guess because of the fact that Malaysia has been in the doldrums of neither here nor there for the past five years, the worst part about it, Vijay, is the fact that we've become forgotten. Forget about saying, oh, we don't like Malaysia. People don't even talk about Malaysia anymore, right? So some of the investors, we have we they are indifferent to Malaysia, and that's the worst thing to, to have, right? It's it's you overlooked. Yeah, it's you overlooked. Know, it's overlooked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, but you so, see that in, in that new, let's say the, the new phase that, that assume that it's going to be a new government. Who is going to lead it remains to be seen. Uh, where do you see the role of business in that in that uh, new uh, scenario? There's a need for the business to engage. You think the business is ready, willing uh, to engage to help whichever government comes to power, 
uh, steer these economic troubled waters and, and help some bring that stability, which is so necessary for everybody, uh, from you know, men on the street to the big businesses. Definitely. So, so I may get the stats wrong in terms of the percentage, but I think anywhere between 85 to 90% of the Malaysian business is made up of small or medium enterprises, right? So they are essentially the man of the street that opens up a stall and sells, you know, chicken rice, right? Or, mm -hmm. you know, just basically anything below like 10, 15 individuals uh, in the company. Uh, but they contribute only 30 to 35% in terms of the revenue. So they're, they're outsized in terms of uh, numbers, but downsize in terms of contribution to revenue, right? So I think what we need to do is in terms of business growth, give these guys a chance. Give the SMEs a chance to grow. So for every SME that triples their number of employees, you've basically tripled, if, if for 15, you go to 45, and then you multiply that across, you know, hundreds of thousands of SMEs, you're creating job opportunities for a lot of people across Malaysia. So yes, I think businesses should be more um, in tune with, um, I guess, helping to build a nation together with the government of the day. But at the same time, I think, we can't just keep blaming government in terms of how uh, businesses are built, right? So government is either there to get out of your way or to help you and give you incentives to help you grow your business, either one or the other. They can't do both, right? Now, and in Malaysia, I think the government, regardless of however whoever has been in power, has always been there to give opportunities for businesses to grow through many, many uh, outreach programs. But I guess because of the fact that we also have many ministries, it's also very confusing in terms of where do we go for that help. So I think for the next government, I think what, what uh, the next prime minister needs to do is streamline this. Streamline the efforts to assist the business community because I guess at the end of the day, the ones that pay the most taxes other than us as individuals are the big businesses, right? Um, and, and I think a concerted effort to grow the next set of you know large cap companies or unicorns in terms of tech startups is something that the next prime minister and the administration needs to look at because that's where the growth engine needs to come from. But in terms of the business community, you, you sense that the business community is also alive to the need for itself to ensure that it does not engage into what I would call reprehensible behavior, engage in any sort of green or other colors of washing. Uh, well, I mean, you can't generalize. I'm sure some business was still green or other colors of washing, right? Um, but but at the end of the day, it depends on enforcement, right? I mean the reason why everybody's starting to behave because of COP26 last year uh, shows that while they may bite or grit their tree teeth through it, change will happen because policies have changed, right? Uh, which is the role of government, right? So I think um, you're going to see a lot of, a lot of, depending on who takes uh, the premiership today or tomorrow, I do hope that there will be some forward thinking changes to help the business community thrive. At the very least, Vijay, from my perspective, to allow Malaysia to attract foreign talent to come in easier than it was before, right? Because you cannot build a, 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 a thriving or vibrant business community by being insular. You build them with the best people around the world, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, that leads me to the question I want to ask you. What do you see as kind of impact of that as a change of leadership uh, on the, the region? On the region? Yeah. So, so I guess I remember having a chat with my colleague in, in Endeavor Indonesia uh, and he was telling me how proud he was to have Jokowi as the president. And Jokowi's time is obviously running out, right? And, and the man on the street is worried because they don't see anybody with that kind of clout that Jokowi has, right? Or had. Uh, so in this case, Malaysia, I guess, to the ordinary Malaysians and the world, I think the brand for Malaysia, at the very least, to the ones outside of Malaysia, they will only know three prime ministers. Mahathir, because he was the longest, and prime minister that did it twice, as an octogenarian, no less. Najib, because of YMDB. And Anwar, because he went to jail because of Mahathir. These are the three most well-known names. But the thing is, you know them because of the scandals. But the truth is, Anwar has got a sterling record, not as deputy prime minister alone, but also as the minister of finance before. So he's the right guy to take Malaysia throughout the storm. And I think at the very least, our neighbours in ASEAN or Asia, or the greater Asia, would know that he has the chops to ride the nasty waters of a very, very tough recession year next year. He's the best guy. He's, he's, he's the most well-equipped. And in terms of the, the wider world out there, how do you see that engagement moving forward with the new government? I No, I, I guess everybody's chomping at the heels to just, you know, um, have the engagement with Malaysia again because at the end of the day we are situated right at the middle between Singapore and Thailand and Indonesia and, and you know and, and we are generally business friendly uh, we've always been business friendly um, it, it's just a matter of look I, I, and I've, I've spoken to a number of investors over the past year and, and from a Malaysian typical Malaysian would be complaining about oh we've lost you know three, three prime ministers uh, but from the outside in the, 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 the sentiment is 
you guys didn't just lose three prime ministers, you lost three prime minister and business still functions. That shows that your democracy works. And that's what matters, right? No one, no one's out on the streets rioting, Vijay. You know, it's a hung parliament. Everybody's still working. I'm still doing this uh, session with you, right? The majority of the Malaysian, um, I guess, uh, citizenry, I suppose, is the fact that business always comes first, all of us, right? Um, you know, we've got to make sure that there's food on the table for the family to eat. And, and we pray for the best. Excellent. Well, Adlin, thank you very much. Uh, Say for any last minute message you receive from the palace, uh, I would <laughs> probably like to wrap up this uh, very interesting, and we could have gone on for a few more hours, yes. uh, because these are very live uh, subjects in terms of our daily lives. It's not just about macroeconomics or, or strategies. It's really about the... Uh, the lives of ordinary people, which then translates into a, a communities and how communities engage with businesses, how governments engage with businesses. I think it's a it's a very uh, uh, humble uh, opportunity for us to to actually bring these issues uh, to the attention of a wider uh, community uh, among the PBEC community as well. And I think my takeaway, basically, from our discussion, Adeline, and and do add to what I'm going to try to suggest is that going forward, uh, stability is, is a key factor going forward. And, and we should not underestimate the importance of stability from a domestic point of view, uh, from a, a, a pure societal point of view, political point of view, and economic point of view. And these stabilities have an interplay. And if one of them is not stable, it will impact the stability of the other uh, pillars. So I think that is a key element. And the other one is, is I think, the, the notion of integrity that I think we need to promote, keep promoting integrity in thought and in action uh, in among all these communities as well, in civil society, among the political leaders, uh, among the business communities, uh, among the NGOs, uh, among all the democratic levers from, from the free press to uh, NGOs and, and getting people engaged because uh, as you say rightly everybody must have their say and everybody must engage it cannot be left to somebody else to do what needs to be done yeah. uh, because otherwise it may not be done or it may be done in ways which actually undermine our own collective best interests so I think it's very important for that and, and also the, the economic focus going forward it, it's not a matter for helping business to focus on the your, your foreign exchange or your currency uh, uh, stability uh, on the recession, on inflation, because the, the, the poorest of the poorest will be the most affected yes. if those uh, uh, issues are not dealt with effectively. So I think having the right people in the right place is key in that. So I think in, in terms, I always say in terms of ESG, key will actually be the G, the governance. Yes, that's absolutely. Get the right. governance right, the rest will follow. Yeah, we get, we don't get the governance right. Nobody else can, nothing else can follow. So I think on on that note, and and Adeline, please uh, let me have a, a last uh, TikTok uh, word from you <laughs> before we close. <laughs> TikTok word. No, I, I I guess my chat is blowing up. So I hope it's I hope it's it's what I think it is, but. I guess from the perspective of an ordinary, uh, you know, in, in my case, Malaysian right now, we're hoping at the very least, as everybody, every citizen in the world would want, right, is to have, as you mentioned, a leader with integrity that would lead um, their country with the the with with, with the sort of um, burden that it carries to turn, you know, 35 million people's lives around, right? I think that's what we're hoping for. So someone that comes in knowing full well that this is a service for something that's larger than life for them, right? that leaves a legacy. So I hope whoever takes over today knows this. <laughs> that, 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 that message ring loud and clear to everybody who's aspiring to become a leader, whether in Malaysia, in the region, or elsewhere in the world, that this is a matter of service to the people, not right. to be served, but to serve. On exactly. that good note, thank you very much, Adeline. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, sharing that moment with, uh, with Adeline and, and, and myself. And I wish you all the very best. Thank, Thank you very you. much for being back. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All the best. Thank you.